Today's object uh, is multi-layered in all of the possible ways. Um, and with that, my disclaimer for today is that I will be flipping back and forth in the PowerPoint, so it won't be a like slide one, slide two situation, because I want you to drive the conversation. So we may skip past something, and we may go back to it, and just know that we'll get to all of it eventually. The order will just be determined by our fate together in this room. So it's senior coffee social. Uh, if we didn't have any social part, it would just be seniors and coffee. And that sounds great, but the social part's awesome. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to show you the object, and then I'm gonna give you 30 seconds. You're just gonna look at that object, and then we'll go from there. So here's our object, slowly revealed by the light dimming. <coughs> We're just gonna quietly look. Share it with someone sitting next to you. Just one thing that stood out that you saw in that work bar. Social. disclaimer that this is water so for those of you who are like man she is really having the coffee no this is just a natural level of enthusiasm supplemented by hydration <laughs> not yet it's not happy hour yet uh, so back to our object I know we just looked at it for just a brief amount of time and that little snapshot and I'm sure as you're looking at it again and just hearing uh, your colleagues who are sitting at the table maybe their response is you're like oh I didn't see that before I'm gonna add a next level to this um, on your table, I have placed an envelope. Uh, it's, a, it's a love letter from me to you, um, or it's just a clue. Um, so on it, what I want you to do is, I want you to look at this work again, and if whoever opens the envelope, if you could just read that clue to the whole table. And then I want you to look at this work of art and see if you can figure out how does the clue tie in in any possible way to this work of art. And that's the part that's gonna lead our conversation. So reveal said clue and see what you can see what you can figure out together as a team. Lots of really good conversation as I'm walking around. It's not art history, it's an art mystery. <laughs> uh, so someone, some brave person, be my first person to tell me, like, what was your clue? And then um, how do you think it connects? And again, all answers are, are totally viable. So doing this together. Yes, in fact. I'll repeat everything. Very good about her. Yeah. What was your clue? No, I didn't hear the clue. Ah. You just 
made an observation. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> Great. So there, that table is picking up on the fact that in the background um, there is a well-renowned -ren work of art that for some of you when I show it to you, you'll be like, oh yeah! <laughs> um, but that work of art in the time she commented on was, you know, was a little scandalous because she's nude in the front um, and the two gentlemen are not. Okay. Anyone want to add to that based on their clue? All right, give me another clue. It's hiding there. I love the, oh yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Okay, it says, 1995, residency to live and work in Monet's, Givenet Gardens in France. 1999, residency at the Cité Internationale des Arts in Paris. Paris. So that clue was that um, our artist, Enrique Chagoya, did two residencies in France. Um, one, you know, with Monet's famous water lilies, um, and the second one in Paris. Both of them about six months long. Um, and that actually relates back to the painting, that original painting. He's, he's there and he's studying kind of the French masters and how that influences his artwork. The other thing that she commented on was uh, the, the people in the front and the fact that their um, version of Senior Coffee Social um, has some things that look like limbs or mannequins, something along those lines. And that clue of it, maybe it's a mannequin or those little white kind of nub things sticking out of those limbs. Is that good? Great. What else? Yeah. His father was a bank employee in the Department of Criminology, which included counterfeit currency forgeries. Any idea how that connects? Well, it refers to the artist, obviously. Okay, great. So the clue was um, his father was a bank employee. He was a firefighter um, for a part of his life, and then he was a bank employee, specifically working in kind of the criminology department, so looking at currency forgeries um, and, and all of counterfeit money, things like that. And um, Enrique is, you know, with him in the studio. So it starts off very much that Enrique says, Dad, can, Dad, can you draw me the dog? Can you draw me the tree? Can you draw me that? And then finally his dad's like, let me just teach you how to draw, and then you can draw your own things. Um, so his dad is really his inspiration for his artwork to come. The other part is that forgery counterfeit part. Any idea how that potentially seeded into a young Enrique's artist brain? When we look at this work of art. <coughs> or partial copy, so it's kind of like forgery. Absolutely, we've got that copy of this famous painting in the back. So throughout Enrique Chagoya's career, he appropriates. So he's kind of you know stealing, he's making it his own, which is essentially a form of a, for a forgery. Um, and he's not doing it exact, he's not like you know making it a photocopy and putting it on there. He's re, uh, repainting it. Um, making it his own in, in whatever ways, but there's definitely the, you can match, so this goes with this. So there's a little bit of that um, idea of that counterfeit and that forgery that he translates into appropriation that really follows him throughout his entire um, artist career up till now. He's still doing that and working actively. Other clues, ideas? You're gonna get a gold star today. Uh, <laughs> and there, it looks like those are the backs of paintings, or else they're flags. Oh yes, you did mention that. Sorry about that. Um, these rectangles. There's six of them at the top. The the one down here is a little hard to see, um, but they're they kind of have like frames. So they kind of like plaques. They've got that little scalloped edge that kind of tells us they're not just a rectangle. There's something special about them. What do we notice about them? 
They're different colors. They're different sizes. Do those colors relate to anything else in the work of art? They're kind of neutral colors. What else? They look like skin tones. I, I go immediately back to my days of teaching elementary school, and we had the multicultural like construction paper pack and the multicultural paint, so the kids didn't have to learn how to mix paint exactly. Um, and that totally reminds me of that. That's what that's what it triggers for me. Um, is that you know there's darker skin tones and lighter skin tones, and some that have um, more rich, warm tones, and some that are a little bit more on the other side of things. So there's nice blend. So we've got six different ones of those happening. I want to go back to this idea real quick. We talked about the fact that this painting was a little scandalous at the time. Um, if you'll notice here at the bottom, I, I, I am not going to, I respect the French too much to try to say anything in French, <laughs> but translates um, to kind of that idea of an exhibition of rejects. Um, and that's not because them as people were rejects, it's because their art was rejected from the big salon. So. 1863 uh, is where those big art salons are happening. Artists are submitting work for, con um, for consideration by a jury. The jury is deciding, yes, you're in. They're kind of making and breaking artists. This year, they basically turn away about like two-thirds of the people because this is right at the beginning of, um, of Impressionism. And they're not, not everyone's quite on board with this idea yet. So all of the people who don't get accepted kind of have a, well, fine, we'll make our own exhibition. And this is one of the stars of that kind of exhibition of rejects. It's rejected originally because this is not what's happening in the rest of the art world at the time. During this time, they're still in that kind of um, really realistic, they're telling uh, myths and legends and storytelling through, like, um, or biblical things through their paintings. They're painted really realistically. And Edouard Marnet is really, He's kind of pushing the lines on that. He's got some heavier brush strokes, even the way her body has a bit of a heavier outline to it. So it's rejected, but it's also very exciting. <laughs> um, and the people in it, both the, the, the female model and the two gentlemen are all people who are Parisian at the time. So they are people that they're like, oh, I know who you are. So it adds a level of scandal because not only is um, it's, it's a fine line between nude and naked, her clothes are kind of piled over here, so it's not quite that she's the model goddess, birth of Venus sort of situation. Um, and the fact that they're clothed and just kind of hanging out. But it's, it's big, it's people they know. She's scantily clad, the paint strokes are all over the place. Um, and so that is what triggers it. The other part that I think relates back to our work here goes back to those frames or plaques. I think of the, the salon at that time and how works of art were hung which is lots of works of art, you know, kind of floor to ceiling. And if you were really important, you were at eye level. And the farther away you got from eye level, kind of that was your status of, well, you're in the show, but we're going to put you like 12 feet up there. Um, and so there's something about the way those frames are that that's, that's how it figures for me. I didn't read anything um, that of Shoboya saying specifically what that is, but in relationship to that painting, I think there's some interesting crossover. What else are you noticing? Like they were being pushed away from uh, the more what we would have called civilized, apparently, Europeans. So I did see a very political statement. Great, we've got a little bit of political statement happening in the fact that our indigenous people are really pushed forward. They've got a lot of detail, um, different than the back. And so potentially these kind of indigenous people are reading different compared to what we would, you know, the civilized um, French happening in the background. So, t t yeah, go ahead. So the legs and body parts are holding are white. Yes. So the two figures are holding, the body parts that they're holding are of a different skin tone. Um, and they're more in the white Caucasian kind of category of skin tone. So there's definitely something that picks up on there. Did anyone have the clue um, that he contributed to political cartoons? <laughs> um, there, that, that, that factors in through his works of art. He likes to be able to say something. Um, it's not always overtly, here's the message, but let me drop these clues and give you a hint at kind of what I'm thinking and where this fits into my, my practice. In part of that appropriation and adding layers upon layers, um, I mean, Manet also appropriated 
So he was looking at these guys from even farther back. But in this particular painting, Shigoya is picking up on Theodore de Bry. And these are some um, engravings that he did. And Theodore um, is doing this series on, basically he's, he's kind of reaching out to explorers who have gone kind of to the New World, uh, the Americas, West Indies, East Indies, and those explorers are coming back and then he's drawing what they tell him. So this in particular is a traveler coming back and telling him about being in Brazil and meeting the cannibals in Brazil. And so De Bruy depicts them, not based on his own experience, he didn't travel anywhere like that. Um, it's just on a storytelling kind of method of telephone. And then Enrique Chagoya is picking that up and taking those same figures and using them in his painting. All the layers, all of them. Um, so you'll see, um, does this have a pointer? Let's find out. You know, there's kind of this like child on over and same thing here. And that repeats in our original work of art. The style of the figures is really different on those two indigenous people than compared to our background people because he really is appropriating from those very different time periods of how artists are depicting the things. What else do you think he's trying to say with this? Oh, go ahead. Is he eating, are they eating the arms and legs or are they playing are they them like an instrument? They're chowing down. They are, uh, yeah, they are, they are cannibals. Um, and they are, it's a delicious afternoon snack, high in protein. <laughs> um, so yes, and, and in De Bry's words, you know, he, he calls this series like the savages, um, because they're these native people, we don't, we don't know anything about them, so clearly they must be savages. And picking up on something that potentially was part of their um, cultural practice to practice cannibalism, where if they defeated whoever's attacking them or whatever that was part of the sacrifice to the gods was you kind of, you, you kind of ate, you ate whoever you just beat. Um, so in this, that adds back to that layer of him on that commentary on the, the skin tone, that potentially there's a shift in narrative happening here. Yeah, so the yellow around her neck, um, from what I can see when we, when we go to the gallery, because this one is definitely one of those works where I'm like, oh, it looks totally different, um, is it's, it's a basically like a cloth. Sometimes when I look at it, I kind of read, I read snake a little bit, but it's not, um, it's just how this fabric here at the bottom kind of curls around a little bit, but it is just kind of a yellow piece of fabric. What other clues did you have? Not yet. Okay, great. This is good. This is what I'm here for. Yeah, it's good. Um, the clue is that some of his works draw upon Mesoamerican, the, the codex, um, an ancient manuscript tool. They kind of read like a book. So you're, you're, it may ring as familiar. I will show you some of his renditions of it. Is this is a better example. Um, the codex at the top. So it's a long kind of a back and forth accordion book, and you can stretch it out, and it's very long. And then this is just one detail of one of those squares. Part of that goes back to his interest in his culture of Mexico. And if you think Aztecs, Mayans, those Mesoamerican, Mesoamerican people are making um, codices as a way of telling their story. Their origin story, the story of their gods, the story of their leaders, the story of their people. It's made on a material called amate, um, which is basically the bark of a like native wild fig kind of made into paper, and then they coat it with a white lime juice, and then they paint it on top of that. The reason why I included this in here is um, specifically because the same material, a mate, appears in his painting. So we've got things like canvas and acrylic, but then we have this extra word in there where the general passerby would not probably stop and Google what a mate is. Um, but, but yes, it's that, it's that reference to the Mesoamerican people, the, of the land he came from. I should also say that this particular 
series that he did on the Tales of the Conquest Codex was 1992. Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1792. Um, and so all of it is really, is it 17 or 16? 14. I just, I really, I, I time traveled a little bit just there. Sorry about that. Um, but he's, he's kind of telling the story of these people uh, being conquered and kind of what that meant, kind of colonialism, all of those sorts of things. And that carries through into the work that we're seeing now. The, in, the residency that we mentioned in Paris and at, at Monet's place um, in the 1995 and 1999 is right before the work that we're looking at came, which is 2000. And at that point in time, he's lived in Mexico, he became a US citizen, but he's, he's there in France for you know six months and again six months, so long enough to really have some good thoughts on kind of what it means to be in Europe and be there. And part of that was he was thinking through the narrative of what, what would happen if we switched histories? Instead of Europe kind of coming and conquering the Americas, what if the Americas had conquered Europe? Like, what would that look like? Would we have pyramids? I mean, we do kind of in the loop, but you know, I mean, would we have like architecturally, would things look different? Would our blend of how our people um, and the different skin tones and all of that, would that be different if we flipped that story? So, I said, there's so many layers, it's, it's so much, yes. Um, so if we look at this, a little bit of this is that flipped narrative. So this is coming right after that residency when he's thinking about, we've got Paris, France happening in the background, We've got these other people in the foreground. And what would that have story look like differently? So that potentially is why they're chewing on white limbs as opposed to um, another indigenous tribe or something from Brazil or somewhere nearby. So he's kind of adding that little layer in. Um, did anyone, who got inspired by Francisco Goya? Did you guys have any thoughts about that? Or were you just like, nope? <laughs> yeah, that satire pipe. So Francisco Goya, um, during his time, is making these uh, engravings that are really about kind of poking a little bit at the church. But he does it in this, like, it's just satire kind of way, trying to sneak in some things. Yeah. He poked at the royal family. Oh, he, yeah, he did a lot of poking. Royal family as well. So perhaps this is a poke at the white people that think they're superior. Yeah. And, but the woman, of course, is less because she's naked. Okay, so yeah, we've got, we've got that, that layer, that, that nudity happening in the background. And it reads differently. The nude happening in Manet's painting versus the rendering of Debray's you know, engravings, they're two very different kinds of nude slash naked. Um, they, they read differently. Um, the front, even though it's you know, probably very inaccurate, um, but it reads as, no, these are, this is people and this, it's more of a historical study, as opposed to there's a bit more interpretation on who is, why is she nude in the Manet painting? What is, what is he trying to tell us? Was she a prostitute? Was she someone who was a little on the shady side? Like, we can lead, lead into that a little bit differently. His relationship with Goya, um, starts pretty early in his artistic career. And he actually looks at Goya's engravings. That's where I pulled the 1700 from. That's where my brain did that, sorry. Um, and he's looking at this and the Goya's kind of description of, you know, this is, um, the sleep of reason produces monsters and those things, those symbols in the background are monsters. They're bats, they're owls, things like that. And then he's making it his own and he's adding things. He's like, let me give you really scary bombs and, you know, stealth and all of those sorts of things. So he's taking Goya's idea and giving a contemporary context to it. And it goes back to that appropriation that he still continues to practice throughout his time. The other part I wanna to touch on that hasn't quite been mentioned yet is the title of our artwork. Oh, this is the other Goya that may be really familiar. Maybe more familiar. Um, this is one of those you can't unsee it, so I apologize in the afternoon. <laughs> um, but there's something about it that rings with our painting that we're looking at today. It goes back to that whole cannibalism part of things. Um, but it's that dark and it's Saturn eating, eating children and things like that. 
Um, so the title, An Object at the Limits of Language. Um, I included a quote on some of the cards that are out there um, that the limits of my language mean the limits of my world. Um, and that was said by um, a philosopher. And I haven't found an exact one for one, but it speaks fairly closely. No, we got the clue. Yeah. yeah. So what do we think of that title? An well, object at the limits of language. I think it means that your language is definitely going to limit your world. The more language you have or the language of the world, which is multiple languages, opens your world up as compared to an indigenous people who have a very limited language. Okay. So that would limit their world. So the idea that language and being able to sp speak multiple languages opens up your world. Um, you can see that in kind of, you, you can imagine in his experiences of, of Mexico, states, France, um, that he's kind of opening his world. But also the idea that potentially our, our native peoples here don't have another language, so their world is a little more limited. Very limited, yeah. Um, we have, go ahead. Shigoya have the same four letters there. So total. Yeah. Um, the other part that um, you mentioned was the idea that to look at a work of art, you don't have to necessarily have a specific language, that you can really interpret it, um, that you can freely decide what meaning you want to add to it that's based on your own narrative and your own history. And so that idea that we have an expanded language potentially talking about the work of art. Whoever controls, whoever controls the language really controls kind of that larger narrative, how it connects with the rest of the world. In a lot of ways, history, right? That language is controlling history because that's what's written down and people are reading or researching it in the future. So if it's an object at the limits of language, it's kind of, I think it's playing on those multiple meanings that we could have that we're limited in potentially how we're perceiving people who are not the same as us, that are different. We've got the layers of kind of the language of that was happening at this time period versus this time period versus a now time period and how all of those layers have different languages of interpretation in them. But also, it's an object. And in some ways, we see potentially Native people as, as objects, especially when they're depicted this way, or our feminine nude in the background could be seen as an object as well. So really, I also see that it looks like the backs of these paintings. 
paintings, if there is a painting on the other side, is rippy. Right? Yeah. So they're they're old. They're wearing away in some way. And um, I'm at the limits of my language. I'm trying to recap that. So hang on, just a second. So I'm gonna start at the beginning and work my way backwards. Um, you mentioned that the frames and that, like picking up on that texture, we've got some drips kind of happening. And so is it like, the, is it those paintings or those frames kind of dissolving or something along those lines? But also you talked about that Shigoya is really, he's given us a big old mashup um, of the way we think, the way we perceive, and these levels of art history and how they kind of come together in those representations of other people. and. I mean, I think I get asked a lot, like, I get to choose whatever object I want, and so it's always one that I, I, know, I know enough about to be like, okay, I know enough that that's going to be good, but then it's also, I want a work of art that makes me ask more questions than I have answers for, and this work definitely does that. That idea that, that the, 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 the male in this image particularly could be um, kind of at a higher level in society. He's got, he's got the feather kind of crown. He's got all of the other decorations and the ornaments and the staff and those things that might indicate that he's an important person in, in that culture. That's a great observation. Yeah. Well, natives also have an oral tradition. So language is how they it's how they pass on their traditions, rituals, and culture. And at least they are naked or nude, but they're at least straightforward, honest. Uh, they present themselves as, well, this is the way things are. Okay, so that idea that um, the Native people had, had, had an oral history, telling stories was how they said things, so they might relate back to that title of the limits of language. Um, but then also that you know they're nude, and this is how they present themselves. Like that, it's not just a random day when they're like, "Let's have naked day," you know, once a year, let's be naked. It's not that. It's just that's how that's how they live. That is their culture, or at least how it's depicted by Debra. All right, so I'm going to flip back because there's just a couple of things we didn't touch on, and I'm not going to spend too much time. Um, but this is another um, thing that happens after his, those residencies. It's, it's that appropriation part, but it's mixed with his time being at Gervinet and like the Monets. I love the top right image because it's a definite, he was obviously thinking about Phoenix Art Museum and our Monet, the flowering arches. Uh, but you've got references to Picasso and Warhol and like those things are happening in here. So his work continues to evolve. He continues to add layers. Um, I highly recommend that you go down the rabbit hole of doing a little bit of research on him. There's a lot of really great interviews where he talks even more about how the influences of his parents and where he grew up and what does it mean to move, study, you know, study political economics in Mexico and then move to the United States. You know, he doesn't say he immigrated, he says he was imported because he met a woman and she imported him. Um, but how that, how that shifts and you know, he tried to study some of that political economics in the Bay Area and wasn't finding the same level of conversation uh, that he had had in Mexico. So there's, there's just, there's all, all the layers. The word of the day is layers. Um, I, again, this is, our, this is our artist, Enrique. And I invite you to come check it out. It very much, I know that every single presenter every single month says it, that you've got to see it in person. Um, this one in particular, even this morning, I was like, oh yes, yeah, no, totally different. Um, I'll probably think that again when we go up there. It's on the third, third floor of the Cat's South Wing. Um, so right when you come out of where uh, the Kusama Fireflies room is, it's right over there. Um, there's also a second piece by Mike Shigoya in the same gallery, so just kind of to the right if you're looking at it. Uh, that has a lot of the same um, processes in terms of another painting being layered behind, pulling appropriated images and those sorts of things. I did not dive down the wormhole on that one because my brain was too full. So I can't answer a lot of questions, but I can encourage a compare and contrast with your buddy. So with that, thank you very much. I'll hang out here and then I'll meet you in the galleries. <laughs>